What up, what up, everybody? This is Double G for FGB Radio. We are going to preview UFC 67, and we'll also talk about the UFC's 20th anniversary, which was just on Tuesday, depending on when you listen to this. Uh, so joining me is uh, my old-time partner who has been away from the podcasting business, at least the online audio podcasting business lately, Jason, a.k.a. The Dirty White Boy. What's going on? Oh, not too much. Uh, you just couldn't get rid of me, could you? There, uh, Double G had to bring me back in the clutch coming in, uh, back like Cook Crack. But I'm excited to be back with you here talking about a pretty important UFC show and the history of basically the UFC. So just to uh, – the, the last time people would have heard you was uh, on one of the WrestleMania 30 for 30 shows that we do with Big D. And you know they, they've heard – our side of of everything, which was that you know you just got a little busy and uh, you couldn't put the time and effort into the show anymore because of just other things uh, that you were working on. So, uh, is there anything else you want to add to that before we get going? No, it's basically I was just so busy doing a TV show for the uh, Ontario University football season, covering two schools. So. It was a lot of work and time and, and effort. So most of my time for when we could have, I could have been a part of those 30 for 30s uh, was occupied with a television show. All right. So uh, that is that. And I hope the TV show is going good. Um, and I hope uh, it's, all, it's all working out for you. Uh, it, thank you. Yes. Uh, the, season, the show just finished a couple uh, weeks ago or so, but. It was a good season and a lot of good moments and stuff like that. So, yeah. Very cool. All right. So before we get into 167, which is this weekend, I wanted to bring up just a, a common theme this week on the MMA blogs and just in the in the online MMA world is kind of just memories of, of UFC being that Tuesday was the 20th anniversary of the very first show, UFC 1. And when did you actually... Uh, I, I don't imagine that you watched it in 1993, but when did you actually come across the very first UFC? I think it would have been somewhere around like 95, renting the tape uh, at the video store because the UFC tapes were in the wrestling section. And I remember picking it up just because the logo of the box, you know, obviously looked different than most of those, you know, WWF or WCW VHS tapes. And I got it thinking it would be professional wrestling. And it was <laughs> definitely not that, but you know, even though it was definitely way more violent than a five-year-old, or the more violence than a five-year-old should uh, really be accustomed to watching uh, the look of the, you know, the early, the early stages of the octagon with like the foam style padding and the first octagon looks so big, just this cool uh, atmosphere. And then with the first fight being, you know, Gerard Gerdo and Tyler Tuli, the sumo guy, I mean, obviously with me being a wrestling fan and Yokozuna coming off as the sumo gimmick, that obviously there was a bit of a crossover there. So I was kind of hooked from the sport at that point a little bit. And obviously, you know, getting older, not being able to get the tapes and stuff like that for a very long period of time, uh, kind of fell off a bit, but... Uh, around, I'd say, the Ultimate Fighter, obviously, uh, that would have been a big turnaround point for me getting back into it. But that would be when I saw UFC 1 around 1995, and uh, just some great moments uh, on that show, obviously, with uh, Superfoot Bill Wallace nearly blowing it, uh, burping, uh, <laughs> and the intro of the show, calling it the Ultimate Fighting Challenge, and... <laughs> Now, we are wrestling fans and we're there for the end of WCW with like an eight man booth. UFC 1 had like an eight man booth. It had like Superfoot Bill Wallace, two other, Jim Brown, Kathy Wallace, and another guy. And the other guy knew his stuff. He understood jiu jitsu more than anyone ever could. So, uh, just a crazy, crazy show. So, you saw it at the age of five years old. Did you understand? the idea of the small skinny man fighting from the bottom uh did you understand that whole thing and were you confused uh as to why the little guy won the whole thing obviously i had no idea why he won but i uh but i i did understand the jiu-jitsu aspect of it 
But I figured because he had a gi on, he was like a secret badass. <laughs> so I think that helped me a little bit understand things. But no, I didn't understand the jiu-jitsu element of it until obviously getting much older and kind of understanding uh, how important, you know, jiu-jitsu and ground fighting is. Now, um, I didn't see UFC 1. I, I'd seen clips. I'd seen tons of footage that was you know put together but i hadn't seen the whole thing all the way through until i don't know maybe five years ago uh and the reason is because when i first started uh the the first ufc that i saw from start to finish would have been the uh the very first tito versus ken match and what was that like ufc 40 40 okay so i i watched that at a friend's house and then the first show that I would have bought myself would have been Chuck Liddell and Randy Couture's first fight. And when Chuck lost, I didn't lose interest, but I was like, ah, bummer. You know, that, that was my guy. Uh, I had a friend who, who was good friends with Chuck, and he would give me stuff. And I have, like, some Chuck signed posters around the house somewhere. And so, uh, you know, at that point, uh, I would have waited until... I think the very first Ultimate Fighter. Now, just by being a subscriber to the Wrestling Observer uh, since probably, I don't know, 99, 2000, I had always kept up with the UFC. I was always reading about it. I was always um, just, you know, reading about sort of the behind the scenes stuff about them not having television and the pay per views and, and losing pay per view and all that stuff. So my first memories of UFC really were this last shot in the dark effort to get television and stuff like that um and so i think like i didn't go back to watch it from the beginning because i just i was so in in once once i sort of decided that okay i'm gonna start following this as closely as i follow wrestling and that was like a big thing too i was like do i really want to get absorbed into this thing because i know if i start i'm gonna have to be as tuned in as possible that's just the way my personality is it's why i can't like pick up like new hobbies or anything because i'll just like i have to like be a hundred percent in and when i decided okay i'm in and i'm gonna start watching every show and i'm gonna start writing about it and i'm just gonna really start to figure out everything is, is about it i just figured like you know what there's gonna be a point in time for me to go back and watch from the beginning but that's not the time i i, I just want to just learn the product so much of the today <laughs> product so when I did finally go back to UFC 1, it was because a, a buddy gave me uh, UFC 1 through UFC 75 on like s some bootleg Chinese t uh, versions of, of the shows. And then I went back, and I, I still am only gone through like the first 11 shows. So from 12 to, like I don't know, 40-something, I, I still haven't seen the majority of those. But um, yeah, so you know, it, it, it's interesting because... UFC 1 is, is very different from how uh, you watch UFC today. Uh, I had a conversation with Duan about whether or not uh, if you know Dana White and the Fertitas had actually picked up the UFC uh, at a later point, and then you know would it work in sort of today's sort of sports industry? Could you take the UFC from 1999 and import it to today, and would they have a shot at surviving? And we sort of talked about you know some of the things that they would have to have, the weight classes, and you know just the the commission stuff, and like we I, I think that that's definitely a part of sort of the culture of sports, and them adopting all of those things. Uh, definitely made it seem a lot more legitimate. Now, in when you got back into it, uh, you would have probably would have probably been about ten years later. So you were still young. You were still like fifteen years old when you got back into it. Did you feel like it was the next big thing, or did you feel like it was still sort of just like this underground cult kind of thing? I didn't feel. I felt. I felt it had like the potential. I wouldn't say it was going to be the next big thing, but I felt it had the potential because I remember being in gym class and everyone in the change room would be like, did you see the last episode of The Ultimate Fighter? Because I had gym on like a Thursday or a Tuesday and it aired right after Raw, right? So, yes. uh, yeah. So it was, okay, let's 
you know, forget the wrestling because the wrestling at that point, it was still okay, but compared to the, you know, the real stuff, it's, it's not the same. And just the first episode of the ultimate fighter or first season, I should say was pretty important. And I think built for me building some friendships in high school, because I had obviously known of like the earlier stuff. And I had seen some of the earlier stuff, whether, you know, the, you know, with your hoises, your Ken's, your tank Abbott's, um, your Oleg Tiktolovs, your Severins, and stuff of that nature. So I had kind of, you know, obviously known the background, but then just getting into, you know, MMA, a sport that I, you know, well, ultimate fighting, I guess, but I didn't know it was MMA at that point, or professionally called that, and mix it with a reality show. I think that added a lot to it because uh, they were able to build strong characters and, you know, guys that have careers and, and lives basically made up for that one season. So you could just definitely tell that this had a potential to be something big, and I, I don't think I or anyone saw it being as big as it is today. Yeah, I think it's a great tactical, and I, I guess you can't even call it tactical because it was sort of like the last thing. It was it was the way that they had to get on TV. But doing a reality show, now we both come from the wrestling background where everything is kayfabe and just characters and pomp and circumstance. And then you go watch this, and it's you know you get to see what these guys are like, and they're just regular dudes who are athletic and they have issues, and even then, like. You know, thinking that these guys were poor, right? Like you watch wrestling, and wrestling's so big, and everybody's like, you know, plays it up as as you know, they're they're just well off and 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 characters. And these guys were like real guys, like uh, just you know, you you could tell that neither of these, not any of these guys, really had any money. Like they had probably pushed their careers off to try to fight, even though there wasn't really a ton of money in it yet, and. I think that was definitely uh, a big part of why I started to like it is because I understood, I got to understand the culture of, um, you know, of, of what was going on and the, the whole, you know, the, the dojos and the, you know, the, the gyms and all that stuff. I thought, I thought that was really cool. And even, you know, in comparison to boxing, you know, boxing, they didn't really – you you have to be a really diehard fan to to really understand sort of the the, the behind the scenes look and really you know twenty four seven was the first show to actually give you access in the way that they did so UFC was still ahead of their time in that sense and I think that you're right you know it was, it was a big deal um, what is your if if you could say like I don't know the first the first twenty UFCs or so, or so what is the, the your favorite fight out of the first twenty UFCs the first, uh, the first twenty. So you're talking one through twenty, right? Yes. Okay. So my favorite fight would either have to be Hoist Gracie versus Chemo from <laughs> UFC three, because Chemo was a character in his own right, and plus that's actually I actually just watched that fight the, uh, yesterday, and it's actually for 1994. It's like the most accurate mma fight i think that could you know if you put that fight on like a card uh, this saturday it would still stand the test of time minus the hair pulling of chemo <laughs> um and as well i'd have to throw um i'd have to throw uh dan severin hoist gracie from ufc4 uh honorable mention from that show is dan severin versus anthony the mad dog macias where there is the absolute perfect german suplex to anthony <laughs> that he nearly dies, <laughs> that you think he's going to die. Um, UFC, the, you have to remember, there's also the Ultimate Ultimates right, that took right. place at this point, so, and, and some of those international shows. Uh, I'd throw Dan, or, uh, Dan, Don Fry versus Tank Abbott in there as well from the finals of the Ultimate Ultimate, 96. Um, and I'd throw... A not like I guess an honorable mention of the Big Daddy Gary Goodridge and Paul Herrera because it's the absolute scariest finish I've ever seen in the history of the UFC where Gary Goodridge uh, basically crucifix Paul Herrera and throws these elbows right to his temple yes. and you think he kills Paul Herrera. Yes, that is very memorable. Actually, Big D just sent me that the other day. Um, I, I'm gonna agree with you on Chemo and Hoist. Like I think. When I started, when I went back and, and decided that I'm going to watch the early ones, there, I mean, there's some boring stuff in it. Like, you know, there's a lot of long matches of guys, you know, not really knowing what to do. 
But that match had a beginning, a climax, and an ending in such a short amount of time, and it was fantastic. And uh, Kimo, you know, really, Kimo should have been in pro wrestling. <laughs> like he, he was awesome. Oh yeah, like even when he comes out, one of the commentators is like this is like from the WWF or something like that, and just like how did Vince not get him? Like he could have been the badass. Like Reverend Devon before Reverend Devon. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Now, uh, you know, the first several years of, I guess, you know, I would say right, right in 2005, you know, when you started to pick it back up, who was your favorite guy? I'm not going to lie. I was a big Josh Koscheck fan from The Ultimate Fighter season one. I definitely enjoyed him. Uh, I remember when he fought Diego in the UFC after the show. I was at a table with a bunch of my friends, and they were talking about the that, the fight where that they had, and I was just like, "Can't believe Diego lost!" And I was like, "Yeah, my main man Koscheck won, and this created this horrible atmosphere at the table because <laughs> everyone else hated him, obviously buying into his heel tactics." And I was like, "But they don't get it. That's just my thing." So I, I mean, I was a big Koscheck guy, and I guess because I'm Canadian, you know, GSP was at that point in time a big, big deal, and he helped, I guess, create a lot of interest in the sport in my high school just because he was the Canadian guy that you know had a championship or was in the top tier of the sport. How do you feel about GSP today? Um, well, his past couple fights, I'm not gonna lie, I definitely rooted against him. Uh, especially that Nick Diaz fight. I wanted more than anything the Nick Diaz to win. But, you know, there's one thing you definitely can't take away from him is he's definitely one of the best in the game. He's, you know, maybe he fights a style to win instead of trying to put on an exciting fight, which, you know, for a person putting the money on the line, that's maybe not a great style. But, you know, to be one of the greatest of all time, uh, it's a, it works for him. Uh, so the, I mean, this weekend I'm probably going to root for him because I think Johnny Hendricks would be the most boring champion in the history of the UFC. What What do you think is boring about Hendricks? He fights fantastic. Like he's definitely a knockout, drag him out guy. And his last fight with Carlos Condit, I think, was the second or one of the best fights the UFC's had this year. But I think as a person, he's just boring. Interesting. Have you watched any of the primetime series? Now, I haven't done that yet, but, I mean, maybe that can change my opinion, but... I, I would say, um, if you don't have a lot of time, just watch the third one. The third one is good. The first one is eh, second one is okay, but the third one is really good. So, I, I would I would just watch the third one if you don't have time, but... Um, okay, so, so Koscheck, um, GSP, you know... When I when I got back, you know, when I actually it was really getting into it for the first time outside of, you know, reading about it and, and, you know, knowing a little bit about it. I knew about the guys. But when I first started watching it, obviously, like I said, Chuck was my guy. Brock Lesnar was obviously uh, I was a huge fan when he came in in 07. Uh, oh, and, and immediate, yes, immediately absolutely. was just I, I was just team Brock and, and I found it hilarious how the mma community the underground community treated Hated him it. yes i remember watching uc 91 when brock fought randy for the title and he won after he knocked him out me and my friend were like we're going on sheer dog right now sheer dog's <laughs> down i'm like brock lesnar's broken the internet <laughs> brock lesnar broke the internet everyone so i mean that was a huge moment for me and my one friend because like, I knew he was a big wrestling fan, but I never knew he knew this much about MMA. And then when Brock was kind of like the, the, you know, the final connection for us, basically, because, you know, pro wrestler, but he, we knew he could kick ass in MMA. So, and then when he finally got that title, it was just, it was just the icing on the cake. Uh, so many, so many great shows down the line. I mean, even before the Brock era. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, uh, <clears throat> doing, you know, made a point. Uh, in that, like right around like the late '50s and early '60s shows, you just felt like the UFC was, you know, there's a, there, there's something to to being like really hot. Like WWE 1998 was really hot, right? But the bubbling, like the getting there, like you can just feel the momentum and you can feel things are going the right way and everything. You're so excited to watch a a, a show. 
that's what it was like in that time was like you just couldn't wait for the next show. Now, you know, today it's not like that anymore because there's a show every other week, but there's still um you know, I still look forward to the to the big fights and and such. I I uh I would say that my third favorite guy is probably Matt Hughes and the reason is is because I found him to be uh not very entertaining, but I found him to be kind of no nonsense, and I liked his I liked his ability to kind of just be himself, which was pretty much like a dick. But he just kind of walked in the cage. He, he had one strategy, and he did that strategy, and he won with it until they figured him out, and he couldn't win with it anymore. But that stretch of fights where Matt Hughes would just go in there – shoot on guys take them down and treat them like they were um like he was their uh, superior i i really loved that era of matt hughes uh i've never really bought into the rick rich franklin hype though i will admit to being kind of feeling really badly for him when anderson silva would just beat the living uh breath out of him but uh yeah those are my guys so um do you have like a most memorable moment like if there was like one moment that that you would say that got you hooked on MMA and that made you a fan for life like what would that moment be I don't know if I'd have I just I think to me it was the difference that MMA was from any other type of sport that, you know, combat sport that I liked. I mean, obviously there was pro wrestling, which, you know, you kind of knew there was a bit of a fix in it. Boxing, you know, it was stand up, knock them out, drag them out, you know, stand up guys or, you know, speed. And, and you had a bit of a, a certain class to it. This didn't at a point in time, but it developed and metamorphosized over time, which I guess is something that I, I can appreciate. And I think for people of my generation, it's rare that you get to see a sport truly evolve over a, a time period like for you know me growing up like hockey is always you know there's minor changes but hockey is always going to be hockey it's you got you know a center a right wing a left wing a defenseman a goalie i mean the base of the game is get the puck in the net basketball base of the game get the ball in the hoop soccer score a goal like it's the same thing this sport changed from basically of we're going to kill you in a cage to it's a legitimate sport now covered on, you know, sports center. So I think that's, I guess, the one thing for me. I think the one thing we also need to talk about that um, you told me to watch the uh, UFC 20 documentary. And while they definitely made mention of certain guys helping the sport in the early stages, I think the one thing we need to make mention is the parallelisms that they tried to have with wrestling and the fact that they had some support from the WWF, I think that helped a lot of people get interested in the world of uh, UFC. I would definitely agree. Uh, Spike TV, uh, you know, got WWE's approval to do that reality series right after wrestling, which meant, you know, they had a they had a bigger audience to 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 sample the show, I guess, right from the start. Um, and, and it's kind of funny because if we go back to like WWE 1997 and Ken Shamrock and, and WWE bringing in Severin and, you know, they're talking about UFC shows that, that are going to happen. Like there was some synergy back then. I don't know if Vince just saw them as, you know, sort of this underground thing, sort of like how he saw ECW as, and maybe never, you know, never really branching out of that. But, you know, he, he tried to he tried to utilize some of those guys and, and Shamrock got to be a pretty big WWF superstar at that time. He never got to the top, but you know, he got pretty close to, to where, you know, to the apex of, of where things were at that time. And maybe if it didn't branch out as quickly as it did and you know, and, and the superstars like Austin and and rock were created you know maybe he does get a shot but those guys were just bigger than life um yeah i do think that they they deserve some some you know an opening opening up the the eyeballs a little bit because you know the other thing is is if wwe didn't suck so badly in 2005 like <laughs> you know like it was really like there there were some brutal brutal times and you know we're kind of seeing it again though not as bad 
and you know people were sort of growing out of out of WWF at that time they're doing so many dumb things uh, um that UFC was able to to take some of those folks and you know like I already mentioned but you know Brock Lesnar like he he went from being a very uh, bigger than life character who probably never reached his apex in wrestling to being the biggest box office star the UFC has ever seen for that short period of time. Dana White uh, still calls GSP like his pay per view king, but uh, Brock Lesnar is really the guy. He brought yeah. so much attention and so many casual fans to the UFC uh, for his shows that, uh, you know. Lesnar should still be getting checks from Dana White. Oh, I'm for sure. And especially around the, well, the, the point in time I'm thinking is like 2007 when WWE was horrendous. Absolutely horrendous, I found. Uh, MMA as a whole was just this thing ready to explode because not only did you have UFC, you know, finally reaching a lot of you know, much more interest from mainstream media. But you also had these other promotions like Affliction Startup and Elite XC make real runs. And, you know, for us wrestling fans, we understand that competition creates the best. And that's what it was doing. I mean, it was creating some of the best cards UFC had to put out. And, you know, a lot of guys got a lot of, you know, uh, stardom based off that from whether they were in UFC or Affliction and or Elite XC. So, I mean, that point in time to me was... The, one of the most exciting points for the sport of mixed martial arts. How do you feel about the the UFC today? Like, I, I, I don't imagine you're as wide-eyed and fired up about it like you were five years ago or six years ago. But uh, I know personally just from talking to you that you are still much more vested in, in the UFC today than you are in WWE, for say. Um, I mean, I think the thing with at least the UFC that it, that you know we'll have over you know WWE for sure is if I wanted to watch UFC with a bunch of friends, I can easily do it because it's created it's a sport, and you know there is still some big potential stuff they can do. Um, and the past couple pay per views they've had, I think, actually have been fantastic and well worth the money. I can't say the same for WWE, even though I haven't bought anything since Lord WrestleMania. <laughs> Like, and that's probably true. Like, I couldn't imagine buying, like, Battleground or something like that. How how would that work out for people? Was it good? Bad? Awful? Bad. Awful? Bad? Okay. So, yeah, I mean, it's still a big, good product, but the, there isn't the same buzz just because they are doing, like, so many shows, and I think their still mentality has got to have all these fights. But then again, I can kind of see where they come from because, you know, they're just so bloated with a roster, right, that they have to get all these guys a certain amount of fights and stuff of that nature, and, and they have the TV to do it. So there's that. I mean, once they killed off Strike Force, it was like it's going to be a while before someone really makes a run. Bellator is trying, but I mean, it's just it's just not there. And the, the fact that their pay-per-view kind of died – on them that kind of hurt them a lot um okay so <clears throat> let's talk about ufc 167 aka the 20th anniversary show i think it'll be interesting to see if they bring back a lot of the older guys like we know ken shamrock and frank shamrock and tito ortiz are kind of persona non grata so they will not they will not be there but i do wonder if they bring back you know who, who could they bring back that uh, would actually be kind of cool, like uh, Pedro Hizo, just to show him, or you know, Don Fry, Don Fry, they, Don. Fr so if they brought back people from UFC One, if they brought back Taylor Tooley, that'd be <laughs> awesome. Uh, Kevin Kevin Rogier, like maybe if they bring back like everyone from the first UFC, wouldn't that be kind of cool? Uh, well, you have to imagine that Hoist is going to be there. Uh, Hoist is there. I've already seen Hoist do. He Hoist today rolled with GSP in the workouts. Oh, nice! So there's that. Um, would so you, if they brought, would hmm? you would you want to see? Is Art Jimerson still alive? Yeah, Art Jimerson was in that UFC 20 piece. Yeah, he was in that documentary. Uh, uh, he he should come into the cage with one boxing glove on. Yeah, he should do that or one shoe. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, Zane Frazier, because Zane Frazier is the only man in the history of the UFC to ever be finished by stomped to death. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and I guess Gerard Gerdeau, considering uh, 
he was in the finals against Hoist in that first UFC. Uh, as well, he still admits he never tapped out <laughs> with blatant footage. Apparently, Sports Illustrated in those uh, Where Are They Now features did one, I think, a couple years ago or the last one on everyone in UFC 1. I must pick this up. So, I mean, there's going to be, obviously, the, the regulars. Hughes, Shamrock, I mean, uh, Chuck. Uh, Franklin, though Franklin's still still he hasn't retired yet, but those guys will definitely be there. Um, I think I, th- I think it's going to be fun to see some of those old guys. Hopefully, if they have time, they'll be able to to do a little bit of showcasing those guys in the crowd or bring them into the cage or something. And, and you know, not, it's nice to throw back to your history. And uh, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna call this the anniversary show, I think you have to do that. Well, the thing I will say with the anniversary documentary, I was happy that they talked a lot about SCG. I was worried that they're just going to be like, SCG, it started, UFC won, and then Dana took over. Like, I thought that could have been the documentary, but they they treated it right. It was a very well put together piece. So, I I would agree. I I, I think I would say that it wasn't the most slickly produced or... You know, there the, there wasn't a lot of ups and downs in the story, and part of it is because I know the story. I, I, I will say that I could do without the David Spades of, of the world being on that show. Like, they have nothing to do with the UFC other than being Dana White's buddy. So, <laughs> I like, I saw David Spade, and I was like, come on, dude. Like, we, we do not need you on this show. And who else was on the, the Red Hot Chili Peppers guy? Uh Anthony Kiedis. And, yeah, there was a and one. and uh, one of the dudes from the Beastie Boys. Oh, was the Beastie Boy on there? I didn't mix see. mix Master Mike. Oh, okay, so yeah, like those guys. Like I wanted to see more historians, um, more journalists, more uh, people who were there. You know, where was the melts? That's what I wanted to know. Where was the melts? Um, so he says that he was. Uh, I don't remember exactly when they taped, but. He was out there uh, covering the UFC at one of the shows, and his cell phone uh, died. <laughs> so I guess they had tried to contact him uh, to, to record his part uh, while his cell phone died. And by the time he went back to his hotel to charge up the cell phone, it was uh, it was too late. So he missed out, and uh, he did not get a chance to be on that documentary. But you know, just uh, more guys from the early days who were there, who were covering. But then, you know, uh, D- Josh Gross wasn't going to be there because he doesn't like Josh Gross. So, uh, you know, th- I think but that. Could've... But Dana has stated he's cool with Sheardog, and Sheardog now has media press access because Josh Gross and Loretta Hunt no longer work for Sheardog. So they could have had maybe someone like Jordan Breen. Who's one of the top uh, MMA guys for yeah. Sheer Dog? Yeah. on there, and I know Sheer Dog has done a. They've actually recapped every UFC <laughs> in the past two weeks. No uh, way. Yeah, from you, they did like UFC one through. I think they've just done up until like one twenty one, awesome. Which was Kane and uh, Brock. Awesome. All right, so let, let, let's talk about this 167, um, obviously headlined by GSP and Johnny Hendricks. Uh, the semi-main is Rashad Evans and Chael Sonnen. Uh, the first UFC fight of Anthony Pettis' little brother, Sergio, Donald Cerrone, and Evan Dunham headlined the, uh, the Fox Sports 1 portion of this card. So there is going to be some good stuff on this show. I, I'm almost certain that there's going to be some good stuff. Um, I don't know for sure that there's that one killer fight that everybody is dying to see. I guess GSP and Hendricks comes close. Um, I, the, I, I, w- I guess the fight that I'm looking most forward to is uh, Royer McDonald and Robbie Lawler. I think that could be really fun, and I... I hope Robbie is able to land. I'm not quite convinced that he's going to be able to land, but if he does, this thing could get really fun. Um, what is your overall feeling uh, as we are now, you know, what, four days away or whatever? Like, do you, do you feel like this is going to be a big show or are you kind of just like, eh, it just feels like a regular UFC show? I think it'll be a big show just because GSP's on it and, and Chael being on it will help. Um, but I mean, I don't have the buzz, but then again, I haven't immersed myself in a lot of the countdown stuff, which helps. 
Um, I think by Friday I will feel a little different, but I think it'll still do very well on pay-per-view. And I look at the card. I think it's going to be a fun show. So I think if you, I don't think you have a, if you don't have a reason to miss it, you really shouldn't. Uh, let's talk. Uh, I mean, I, I don't really want to talk about you know Sergio Pettis and Will Campuzano. Like I, I think. You know, That'll I, be a fun fight, I think, though. Like, I think, you know, most people expect Pettis to win. He's kind of comes in with a with a bit of a name because of his brother, and they've kind he's of been, the uh, he's the biggest favorite on this card, too. Yeah, they're they're tracking him. You know, people have been tracking him for a while. Cerrone and Dunham should be fun. Herman and Talis Leite should be interesting. Ebersol and Story, that those should all be fun. But I guess let's let's just talk about the main card because I want to have enough time to talk about the uh, the main fights here. But the first fight is a flyweight fight: Tim Elliott and Ali. I don't even know how to pronounce his name. Bogatinov. Bogatinov. Looks like that. Uh, apologize to Ali Bogatinov for how you just totally <laughs> didn't even try to pronounce his name. The first, and you're a podcast host. Well, they, I, I mean, if you, if you have a, if if you're fighting in the U.S. and you have like a Wait, what really did you name Smith. It, no, no, no. <laughs> Ali Bags. Like no. just shorten it. Just just he's, just call he's yourself not a, Bags. He's not a B-list rapper. <laughs> okay, he's a professional fighter. Ali Bags, how memorable would that be if he was to beat Tim Elliott? Uh, by kicking him in the bags, much like <laughs> Bobby Green did uh, uh, last week. <laughs> Do you know anything about either of these guys? Uh, honestly, no, because the flyweight division is still up, up and coming. And unless, unless you're Demetrius Johnson or John Dodson, uh, I, I'm, I'm fully unaware. But I feel it could be a fun fight because the flyweights usually do bring it. Uh, Ali is a part of uh, Greg Jackson's team. And uh, Tim Elliott, whose last name is not uh, as hard to pronounce. Hard to pronounce. (laughs) (laughs) Um, he's uh, He's on the Grindhouse team. So I will just admit to not knowing much about either guy, though, um, you know, Tim Elliott has had one fight in in the UFC. He beat... uh, 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 Godno, Godno, Louis. Louis Godno. Yeah, he, he, he the man joined. with the green hair. Yes, he and uh, this is going to be um, Bogdanov's first fight in the UFC. So not a whole lot of stuff. Actually, no, second fight. He beat uh, a Mar- a Marcus uh, Vinicius. 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 So second fight for both guys. I would imagine that they have uh, pretty high hopes for both guys if they're putting them on the main card of this show. To open, you know, the one thing that I did recognize about the show is no female fights. So I sort of figured, like, you know, a way to get a, a cool, uh, a cool start to 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 the show would have been female fights. But you know, they do have Ronda and uh, Misha next month, so I guess it's not. Too and bad. they have the finale. Yes, like, the next, which I'm sure we're going to see a bunch of ladies scrap. Have you been watching the show, by the way? Not at all. It's really I- good. I watched last week's episode where the British dude fought. Yes. What's his, what's his name? Uh, Michael. Mike, Mike Hooten. Yes. My mom doesn't watch much MMA or anything like that, but she caught him, wanted him to win so bad. <laughs> got his ass kicked. Yeah, just, just, did, crushed, did, not, just did not look comfortable fighting uh, the, the team alpha male uh, Holdsworth. Well, he admitted in the like on the build up to the fight that he was ready to go home. It's like, well, why, why are you fighting then? <laughs> like, just leave. Yeah, that that was a little bit of a, a precursor to what was about to happen. But I will I will say that the Misha and Ronda dynamic is really cool. The female fights have been excellent. The, most of the guy fights have been just kind of boring, kind of there. But the dynamic of having the women and the men in the household is is cool. It, it's definitely. The best season, probably. Uh, I don't know since maybe Evans and Rampage. I, I I did like the one live season that they did that one year because I like Faber and I like Dominic Cruz, so that was fun. But overall, I think it's the best season. It's just too bad that it's on Fox Sports One and no one's really watching it. Has there been any uh, smushing between the male and females? Well, since half of the females are lesbian, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, some of them are, but they're I legit. That could have been a legit stat right there. Okay. <laughs> like not even kidding. Like I was not shocked. <laughs> um, there has been some flirting. I wouldn't be surprised if there was something going on in the house, but they haven't showed yet. So, um, they haven't even really teased it outside of, you know, a couple of, uh, couple of crushes going on, but that's it. Mm. Okay. Uh, Josh Koscheck and Tyron Woodley. Which, T. Wood. Which I would say that Koscheck is just too good to lose against Woodley, but he's been struggling of late. And I will say that the Robbie Lawler fight was a little bit of a fluke, the way that that fight ended. Um, you know, losing to Hendricks, there's no crime in that. But not to say that, you know, leaving AKA is this big deal or anything, but, you know, he, he has been on his own pretty much since then and has not looked great. Uh, you got to wonder how much Koscheck has left. Uh, and, and if he, you know, his, his first UFC fight was in uh, the Ultimate Fighter finale was April 9, 2005. So he's been around for eight years now. So... He's facing kind of like a, uh, I wouldn't say a younger version of him because it's not like Woodley is is all that young, but um, you know Woodley's thirty five or no Koscheck's thirty five, Woodley's thirty one, but it's it, it does seem like Woodley has a lot less tread on those tires. Do you do you see Koscheck's uh, overall just you know guile winning out, or do you expect Woodley to kind of push him around a little bit? I. I'm favoring the T Wood in this one because I feel Tyron Woodley's got is younger and he's got he's got a lot of power in those hands. Uh, he was the first project from the days of the Strike Force Challengers, and he's uh, kind of paid off. And when you look at his record, I mean, a lot of top guys he's fought. I mean, sure, he had tough tests and lost to you know the likes of Nate Marquardt, which a couple years ago that wasn't that big of a deal, and a split decision loss to Jake Shields, no crime. Uh, but I think he's just going to bully. He's a little bit bigger. I think he's he's a strong wrestler, too. I think he's going to – and he's got – I think Koscheck's chin's finally going away. So I'm leaning with the T-Wood. Yeah, you know, I really was about to do that as well. Um, the only thing that stops me from doing that is I think Koscheck knows that he needs to start fighting a little bit smarter. And there there was a there was a time where – he fought fairly smart, and then he decided that he wanted to be the uh, the knockout champion of the world to to win a lot of these KO bonuses. And he started to let his hands go, and I think just like you said, he um, you know he's he's taken some shots, and and he's learned that okay, like you know when I when I open myself up like this, uh, it it's not very good. I expect a super tactical fight from him. I expect him to uh, kind of use his savvy uh you know get get smart takedowns you know to kind of close out rounds i do expect this thing to go to a decision and i just think that koscheck sees this as kind of like his last real uh, his last real chance to get back into the swing of things um woodley is i still think he's an interesting interesting prospect but i do wonder if he's kind of reached his potential because like you said he you know they had him in the challengers and he was kind of climbing the ladder but every time they've put him in with anybody who could kind of defend his wrestling um he's been stymied so i i I sort of see that happening again now you know unless he's continually getting better and i have just missed it um that 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 may be the case but i'm taking cost check by decision so uh next fight is Roy McDonald and Robbie Lawler and it's interesting that they 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 pair up McDonald and and GSP to you know for for that Canadian audience the the bang for the buck there and uh they're coming for those tag team titles they, they should they really should just have tag team MMA and there's your your babyface tag team for a year until Smarmy Rory just turns on George. Exactly. Well, I mean, we can see the heel turns coming. I mean, he already dresses like a heel. He does. He, he, I mean, he's the, the living, real-life model Rick Martel. That, that, that's, that's good. If, uh, so are, are you then comparing GSP to Tito Santana? 
Oh, well, uh, I, I don't think a lot of people want to say Ariba every time they uh, <laughs> see. But when he throws that Superman punch, it is kind of like Tito's flying forearm. Very, so very close. Th- they are very close. Uh, it just needs Bobby Heenan with a, a, a Latino uh, reference. Uh, but uh, he's a French Canadian, so it could be like a big, uh, a big bowl of poutine coming at you. I don't know <laughs> what it could be, but... Uh, I don't know. That would be sad if George is Tito because Tito, everyone was a jobber for the rest of his career after Strike Force. Uh, El Matador was. Uh, Come on, he was okay. He yeah. was, wasn't he on like a winning Survivor Series team as El Matador one time. I I believe he was, but I think he may have been with some of the worst like. The worst Survivor Series elimination match ever. <laughs> I'm going to look this up right now. And I, as while I do that, talk about... I think this is going to be the most interesting fight on the main card other than the main event. Because I think if you want to talk about the sport coming full circle, it really is. Because it's Robbie Lawler, a old school stand-up brawler versus a new generation of a guy born into doing this. Which is, uh, you know, what... It's going to happen in the future and continue to happen of guys training mixed martial arts, not just, you know, uh, you know, Muay Thai or Jiu Jitsu or Ninjitsu like Scott Morris from UFC 2. Uh, <laughs> it, it's just the, the full circle fight. And, you know, I think it's a bit interesting. I've, we haven't seen Rory that much in a while, but Robbie's been picking up a lot of wins in a, in, over the past, you know, two performances in the UFC and, you know, really proving that his tank isn't on E yet. So I think this is going to be a, a real exciting matchup. It's the complete fighter versus a guy with hands and, and strong wrestling. So yeah, no, I'm only I'm only with Rory. I, I agree with you uh, in, in the interesting storyline of this fight because when I like like I was saying when I first started watching the UFC really heavily, I was going back to Blockbuster like you had mentioned you had you'd seen UFC 1, the tape and I was just renting out all the DVDs of all the old shows just to kind of gain the history of what was going on and it seemed like Robbie Lawler was on like every other DVD like he was fighting all the time and so, you know he fought uh, from UFC 37, then he fought and a half, and he th- fought, then he fought on 37 and a half, and a half the on Fox best damn sports show then he, then he beat the great Tiki Gozen at uh, UFC 40, uh, lost to UFC, uh, lost to uh, Pete Spratt at 42, beat Lytle at 45. And then got knocked the fuck out by Nick Diaz. Got p- put out by Diaz at 47 and then lost to Evan Tanner at 50. And then he went away from the UFC for a very long time. And we, you know, we saw him at Strike Force. He fought at Elite XC. Uh, he was on the IFL for a little bit, so he kind of made his way. And you know, earlier this year, he was back in the UFC. We talked about the Josh Koscheck fight where he where he uh, knocked Josh Koscheck out, uh, even though it was you know I, I don't think Koscheck yeah, Koscheck would probably not really consider that him you know being knocked out. Uh, like in most cases, someone would, but he still he got the victory there, and then he beat Bobby Volker. So, at 31 years of age, Robbie Lawler is on his way back, and he is a little bit smaller than the last time that we saw him. He's fighting at welterweight, so we have uh, we have an interesting dynamic in that Roy McDonald is kind of the next big thing in that welterweight division, and you know if a lot of these rumors become true that suggests that you know george is near the end of his run then uh i think a lot of people point the finger at uh, roy mcdonald as to be a guy in the next few months to see uh you know to 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 be able to uh, do something there and possibly be a champion now i would consider uh i i here's what i wonder is robbie is robbie lawler on trt Aren't they all right now? I mean, that seems to be the theme of mixed martial arts. I mean, it's basically like they are. Before you know it, Dana's going to have uh, UFC body stars. <laughs> because if you look at his win loss since uh, when he was in Elite XC, it's pretty much win lose win lose win lose. But two knockouts in a row in his UFC comeback. Uh, maybe he's just been rejuvenated by being under the big lights again. But um, I do think he loses this fight. Um, I think that 
he I, I don't I I'm trying to figure out how can do you think he can get knocked out? I think anyone could get knocked out. Uh you gotta hit someone in the right spot. I think Rory's got a a weird style that could confuse Robbie to potentially get knocked out. I, I could see it, but I mean Robbie's a gamer, so I mean it'd be tough. Because Rory has um he has some some knockouts on his on his record. I just don't I, I don't see him being able to put together enough to knock out Robbie Lawler. So I, I, I sort of feel like a submission, like a late submission, you know, just kind of being really patient and letting Robbie tire out a little bit, you know, maybe late second round, early third round. I could see a head kick knockout, though. That, that, that could definitely happen. That, that could happen for sure. Now, are we going to see the Roy McDonald who uh, beats the living face off of BJ Penn or who takes a little bit more of like a tactical striking uh, position again, like he did against Jake Ellenberger where he, he won the fight, but it wasn't as impressive as when he beat BJ Penn where he just looked like he, he it was sort of like a passing of the torch. Uh, I think maybe we'll, I think we're going to see the Penn style because I think with, you know, I mean, Ellenberger and Lawler are kind of similar as they have amazing power in their hands, but I think McDonald can do enough to keep, uh, Lawler away, especially with his lankiness for that McDonald. That is, I think he can keep a good distance if he uses the jab, and then make Lawler come to him, and then make him fight his fight. All right. So the semi main event is Rashad Evans against Chael Sonnen. This is a weird one, right? These dudes host a show, a pregame and postgame show together. Have no beef whatsoever. It is sort of like an, a sportsman contest to see who is better. I think that even better than this fight is going to be the next time they do media together and they're on the same panel again where they can just whoever wins this fight just can trash talk the other. Uh, I'm waiting for the sitcom of uh, uh, Rashad and Chael coming to Fox <laughs> in, the, in the, the new year. Uh, but no, I mean, for for two guys with names like this, I, I should be more jack, jacked up and yay sports, but I'm not. I mean, I'm just, there's no interest for me. It's just, they're going to go out there and like grapple or play fight for three rounds and whatever. And it's like Chael already has a prior commitment after this. Like he's coaching tough Brazil. <laughs> he is. Like, like why would I care? Well... Uh, here, here's the, I guess here's the interesting thing for me is that this is now the – what is this? The Would this be the third fight in a row where he fights at 205? I think so, yeah. So he, he lo- obviously lost to John Jones. Uh, it did not look good at all. And then he beats Shogun with a guillotine. Dominated him, on, actually. On, dominated him. On the fight night, the first fight night on Fox Sports 1 where he looked absolutely fantastic. And then you look at Rashad who if, – if we go back to you know the, uh, the fight with John Jones, which was built up very well. He had beaten Phil Davis right before then in a very boring decision. Like that was like one of the worst – the worst uh, decision fights of two super talented guys I've ever seen. UFC on Fox 2. Yep. <laughs> and then loses to Jones, did not really look competitive at all in that fight. Loses to Little Nog. Like, come on. Uh, little, <laughs> when, when is Little Nog ever in, like, these little, you know, these play fights? Like, usually something happens in his fights. He loses by decision. And he beats Dan Henderson by split decisions in... Probably the worst main event of the year so far for a numbered show. Like, I just don't see Rashad uh, coming in into this fight with a whole lot of uh, of juice behind him. It, he, I, I don't know if the sport has passed him by. I don't think so. I, I just think he's uh, he's a little bit. He's he's he seems to have fought a little bit shell shocked uh, uh, recently. I don't know if it was the Jones fight that did it or whatever, but. He has not looked impressive. And then on the other hand, you have Chael, who looked amazing in the last fight. I, I think I'm leaning Chael, even though I do think that at this weight, 
it may not be super effective for him to be fighting uh, at this weight against Rashad because I think even though Rashad's not a huge 205 guy, he's actually been comfortable in fighting at this weight for a very long time now. So I I, I just, for whatever reason, I think Chael Sonnen's going to win. I don't think he's going to, I don't I, like you said. I don't think you know it, there, it's going to be sort of a, a friendly kind of thing. I don't think these guys are going to try to take each other's heads off. But I do see Chael winning, and I could see him winning uh, a, a pretty uh, impressive decision. I am leaning with Chael too. I think just Chael's going to be a little better, and I agree with your point on the fire. I just don't see Rashad having the same fire. I know Dana White has questioned the same thing from Rashad, and especially today with Rashad busy tweeting or. Put in pictures on Instagram of him and Rampage Jackson. <laughs> that was kind of funny. Rampage did not look thrilled to be in that picture, by the way. He never looks thrilled, but if you read the little caption, it seemed like uh, they were kind of happy to see each other, I guess. Like, at least Rashad made it seem that way. Do you think Rash- Rampage told Rashad, Rashad, you cocky. <laughs> <laughs> you too cocky, dog. You too cocky. <laughs> That's what they should have called Tough Ten, you too cocky dog. Speaking of Rampage, do you have any interest in watching him fight this Friday? Absolutely, because if he loses, Bellator looks stupid. He can't lose to Joy Beltran, can he? Joy Beltran's a gamer, though. Joy Beltran, the only man I've ever seen really dominate Joy Beltran is LeVar Johnson. And that well, those were some scary uppercuts. I don't know if well, Rampage still has that type of power. But I think Beltron can do enough to potentially be could potentially beat him. Uh, I hope for Bellator's sake that Rampage wins. You know that what they should have done to save that pay per view, they should have they should have uh, they should have grabbed the man who killed Elite XC, Seth Petrozelli, and had him step in for Tito Ortiz. <laughs> Could you imagine? He just knocks out. <laughs> just, the, what? <laughs> He's just like, hey, you know, if you need me to save your promotion, I'm not the guy. I'll kill it. Just... All right. So now we're at the main event. George and Johnny Hendricks. A lot of people pulling for Johnny Hendricks here. A lot of people who just want to see a new guy win, who are tired of watching George win by decision very strategically i don't know if it's because they like hendrix or because they are just sick of george but everybody they, that i know they're pulling for hendrix to win this fight i think it's more so because they want change change is good i agree change can be good but i just don't think it can happen i just don't see it happening he's gonna do enough to win i think he's game planned against better strikers and wrestlers or anything of that nature. So I I just don't see Johnny Hendricks losing or winning this fight. So you are saying that in the name of Sam Cooke, a change is going to come. It is actually not going to come, and GSP keeps the title. Yes. What I am saying is Tito Santana of Mixed Martial Arts will Ariba his ass around the cage. Okay, so so you think this is uh, going to be a normal sort of GSP, very stylistic and strategic decision? Basically, yes. I, if Hendricks tries to maybe make it into a brawl, I could see GSP potentially uh, you know, clipping him or something like that. As well, though, I was, I'm not saying Hendricks doesn't have a chance because we've seen in the recent GSP fights, he's taken a lot of damage. He took some damage for sure against Condit. Actually, almost got finished by Condit. Yep. And he took some damage against uh, Diaz in a fight that he was absolutely killing Diaz on the scorecard. And th- that third round, there was a moment or two where I thought Diaz, if he had the right punch, would have clipped him and become UFC welterweight champion. So, uh... Yeah, I mean, Hendricks obviously is the better if, you know, he clips him. I think he could finish it because he's got amazing power, but I just don't I just don't see him winning. Yeah, I'm going to agree with you though. I think in these next few fights, if George decides that he's going to stick around and he's going to continue fighting, I do think he's going to lose. Uh I don't know if I don't think it's going to be today, but I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, down the line Hendricks comes back again and wins. 
the the problem with today the problem with winning on Saturday is I do wonder you know it, it's kind of hard for me to say that you know does Johnny Hendricks have the cardio I mean because he he was a wrestler himself and I imagine he's in fantastic shape but in the UFC he's fought nothing but three rounders and so when it gets to the fourth and the fifth round which you know, just about every GSP fight does. I wonder if he can really, um, if he can really turn it up at that point, or if he's just going to be too tired, or, or or not the best Johnny Hendricks. Because at that point, rounds four and five, I expect George to to still be you know on top of everything. And and if Hendricks is not then I could definitely see George putting the finishing touches on the fight. Now, I don't expect that to happen because I expect George to play it a little safer than that. But I do feel like if if it gets past the third round that this is GSP's fight. And uh if I'm you know, if I'm a Hendrix fan and he doesn't knock him out in the first two rounds, I'm pretty worried at that point because then you're looking at a guy who is in always the best shape of of any guy that's fighting. Um, you're looking at a guy who uh, all he needs is just a little bit of a, a little bit of uh, of room to to shoot. And I don't, you know, Hendricks is uh, is a better overall wrestler than GSP for sure. Like he's got the credentials to back it up. But the MMA wrestling game is a little different. And you know, George is going to use those kicks, and you know, he's going to kick to the body, kick to the legs. And then shoot. You know, this is not just you know a shooting match. It's 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 a mix of of striking and and what George is going to do. And then if he does get Hendricks on the bottom, you know, I don't I don't know what kind of you know jujitsu game Hendricks has, but we know that you know George Saint Pierre he's finished guys uh, you know with submissions before. The famous one being uh, the Matt Hughes fight. Um, so. You know, I think uh, I, I definitely think there's a there's a chance for George to finish this fight, which is uh, I think not what a lot of people think. I think a lot of people think that you know it's going to go the whole way and it's going to be your normal boring fight. Now uh, Hendricks kind of goes in there and is able to hit George for the first two rounds. Then we got a whole different story. But uh, I'm choosing George. I will lean decision, but I do think there's a chance that uh, we could get a finish on Saturday night. All right, fair game. So, overall, you know, we got two we got two more big shows for the UFC into the end of the year. Um maybe we'll maybe I'll try to get you back for uh something with uh, the next UFC show for the Anderson Silva Chris Weidman rematch and the Ronda Rousey Misha Tate rematch and uh well, maybe 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 instead of uh Instead of previewing it, maybe we'll recap it or something. I don't know. We'll we'll see. But that's going to be another fun one to talk about. Yeah. I only thing is I don't know if I'll be able to see that. I'll be away. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to see that. Where are you going? Uh, I go away every Christmas. So I'll be in Jamaica. You go away for the whole week? I go away for like two weeks. Oh, my God. So I, I every big show that the UFC puts on at the end of the year, I'm just like, Damn it. <laughs> but there's some little interesting shows coming up. I mean, the finales of The Ultimate Fighter are going to be good. I didn't even know about Mark Hunt and Bigfoot Silva. That screams awesome. And they moved uh, because of uh, the injury situation, Anthony Pettis and jo- uh, and uh, the punk, Josh Thompson, which was kind of like my sleeper fight of the year, is now off of the Fox show, and they moved the... Uh, Demetrius Johnson fight over to that show. So I'm kind of bummed about that. But there, yeah, there are some sleeper cards, you know, that are not the numbered shows. So they, like I said, they're going to end fairly strong. The sad part of it is, is that they're on uh, Fox Sports 1, which nobody is watching right now. So they won't get quite the coverage or the ratings that they deserve. But, you know, they're still building and building and building. And uh, hopefully these last two shows of the year will, uh, will, will do some good business so that they can end strongly. And, um, who knows? Maybe, <laughs> may, maybe, uh, the, the, the fighters who, um, I guess, I guess JDS started the year as the heavyweight champion. Anderson was the middleweight champion, GSP, John Jones. And Henderson. 
Ben Henderson. So there have been two there have been two two title changes so far from the big from the big uh, championships there. So if Anderson does get it back, then it, then we go back backwards. But if Weidman wins, then uh, there's they could they would have had th- uh, half of the champions lose their titles, which is kind of cool. So it is. So um, yeah. So this weekend UFC 167. Uh, should be pretty good. Uh, I appreciate you coming on and hanging out and chatting like old times, and we will do it again, even though we will not be able to do it from Jamaica. But we'll, we'll do we'll we'll do some of these uh, down the line. They are very fun for me to do, especially with my partner, the Dirty White Boy. Ah, uh, of course. All right. So for Jason, I am Double G. We will see you when we see you. Peace out.